there, I got a great video for you today. It's another one from 10 Mothers Farm. And this one's not with Vera and Gordon, but this one is with Luke, who's another member of the team there. And he talks all about their irrigation system. And it's super neat because it's a combination of drip and overhead. And sometimes they have both in the same location. It's also very flexible and portable, which are things that I'm a big fan of. And they're still trying to work out some of the issues and try to get better coverage. They also have some timers to set up. And anyways, there's a lot of cool stuff in here. I know I've made a video about my irrigation system and you guys have always had a lot of questions about it because you're trying to set up your own or improve your own. So there's a lot of good takeaways in this one. So. Hope you enjoy. Hey everyone, my name is Luke. Um, I am part of the 10 Mothers team uh, out here managing the farm. Um, and one part of the farm that I've been managing this summer, or I guess since we got started, was is the irrigation. Um, and as you've heard from Beer and Gordon, the irrigation and water system here has been quite a doozy over the last year as we've been getting established on this new parcel of land. Um, throughout the summer, we've been irrigating, we have irrigated from three different wells and a lot of what we've been doing is not permanent because we're trying to figure out what does and does not make sense um, for this space. Um, so there are a couple different things that we do um, through the, with the irrigation, um, but with our new well, since we haven't dug any trenches and we don't really wanna spend the time doing that this summer or, or busy spring season, um, as we've been using temporary lay flat piping, which as you can see on the ground here, um, if you've worked on any larger scale farms, you can, this is a, a form of water moving that you can use, or of piping that you can use to move water around the farm space. Um, so what size pipe is that? This is inch and a half okay. uh, lay flat. Um, it's called lay flat because as, if you have the water off, um, it will completely lose water and lay flat on the ground. Uh, to my understanding, that's why it's called that. Um, and it's very flexible. You can also drive over it, um, ideally not over gravel, but so a tractor can drive over it and do all the things it needs to do. All right, so this is like a main line here and exactly. then you sort of tee off in different places? Yeah, so we've got our, our main well that we're irrigating from over to the left. Um, and we've taken that and teed off in a couple different directions. Basically one that goes over to our high tunnels. Um, and then we just added a new kind of drain pipe at the low point on that because as we're entering into winter and all of the irrigation's above ground, we don't want it to freeze at any point. Um, so if it's gonna get below freezing, we can drain all the water out of this piping and out of our hoses and stuff. Uh, so that main line comes from the well and tees, goes to the tunnels and then goes to the field. And we have a, a manifold at each, basically at each field section um, that irrigates our five field blocks within each section. Um, and right now we have four different sections out in the field. Um, and we go from there with basically a pretty simple manifold um, that goes to a bunch of hoses. Your typical three quarter inch garden hose is how we've been irrigating so far, um, which makes it really helpful and versatile to be able to irrigate different sections and in different ways uh, throughout the season. Um, and we've been really fortunate with this new well that we have to have an excess of water um, so we really can run a good amount of sprinklers all at once. Um, this section I can turn on and show you. Um, we can run. Once okay, so this is all manual valves at um, this point. So currently we're all manual valved. Throughout the summer, especially in the dryer part, we were using timers. We just use this typical, uh, it's made by Orbit. Yep. Um, it's a four stage uh, timer. It has four different sections it can manage all at once. That goes on, there we go, on the manifold. Um, and then you can set during the day, when we want it to run a cycle, how long each manifold gets run for, um, and how many times a day or how, how frequently it, it runs. And that's really helped us take a lot of labor out of water management and irrigation management. So you have basically a manifold for each field block and then exactly. you put the timer on each. So exactly. there's basically a timer for each field block. Yeah, these um, these little solenoids. switches, yeah, essentially a solenoid valve um, goes on each manifold and just goes on one end and the hose goes on the other. Okay. And then we can set that to be whatever we want it to be. Okay. Um, especially with a lot of our irrigation now being sprinklers it's helped a lot with 
being able to do like short bursts in the afternoon of 15, 20 minutes um, a couple times throughout the heat of the day to help us manage cooling down our temperature uh, for our lettuce or um, doing those short irrigation bursts to keep soil moist to help things germinate um, during the drier, hotter times of the year. So it looks like you guys got quite a bit of pressure. I mean, you're running, I don't know how many wobblers this is right now, but. I've got, let's see, two, four, six, eight, ten wobblers all running right now. Um, and they're all putting out about a gallon and a half a minute a piece. Okay. Um, with a, they have a variety of different valves you can put in the top of them. Okay. And people um, ask all the detailed questions like, is there a pressure regulator on the system? There's actually not. Okay. Um, the well that we have, or the pump that we have in our well is a continuous pressure pump, and it, it we can set the pressure to that. It's set to 50 psi. Okay. Um, and I basically these are running a little higher pressure than I would typically would, um, but I basically go and manage the pressure and the water output per each sprinkler because I've noticed that if I both have, I can run more sprinklers all at once if it's not going through all of these valves. Mm -hmm. um, because you've got throughout, throughout the travel of the water from the source to the output, there are different times when you've got a reduction in pressure. Um, and things like a typical garden solenoid valve like this um, reduces the pressure and flow quite a bit. Um, so right now I typically, I go more and just manage it so they're kind of looking for not too much misting, um, not lo losing too much water from that. Okay, so you're using those valves not just for turning things on and off, but also con to control the flow. Exactly. Okay, so this um, is a real manual, but very precise. Yeah. Yeah, so, and, and part of why the timers aren't on there also right now is because we're entering into winter and these aren't frost-proof timers. Um, so as we enter into frost time, pull these off. And right. We're not irrigating as much now and all that kind of stuff, so it's not as necessary. Okay, and what are the hoses that are running out? Are those garden hoses? They're just typical three-quarter three inch garden hoses um, that run from the manifold to our different um, sprinkler stands. And yeah, so in the field we're using all Right now, most of the field, except for the peppers and the ochre, which just came out, um, and the eggplant, um, which are on drip, everything else is on the full-size Excel wobbler. Um, and we've been experimenting with a couple different types. They've got a high angle and a mid angle, um, and also trying to figure out how to place them within our field blocks, because we've been noticing at the old spot, there was a way that Vera and Gordon were managing it, um, and it seemed to be pretty sufficient in its water coverage and all that kind of stuff. And here, it's just been acting differently because it's a different spot. We have more wind. Um, we have a different water source that has different pressure and flow rates and all that kind of stuff. So, going to be doing a little bit more experimenting as we enter into the winter time um, when we have a little bit more time to see what works best for that. All right, so um, what's the length of these beds here? These are all 50 foot beds. Okay. Um, and our, our, the farm and mainly the field blocks are broken up into eight bed field blocks, um, all 30 inch beds. Um, so two wobblers can do eight 50 so foot beds. Fairly well. Um, I've been experimenting as well in the next section over with doing three wobblers. Um, and I'm liking the coverage of that a little bit more. Um, one thing I've heard and I haven't fully been able to play around with is you want to have them no no further from 10 feet from the edge of your bed um, and then basically each each wobbler and nozzle has a different diameter of flow or a di diameter of coverage and you're wanting to cut that coverage in half and space them so if you're if your wobbler can cover 50 feet of coverage then you want to space them 25 feet apart um, and so we're kind of playing around with different ways of doing that right now. But a big part of that is that nothing is permanent in this system currently. Um, and so this year has been a big experiment as to how, how we're irrigating and the different ways to do that and leaving it dynamic in that way so we can change things and tweak it and really get it to figure out how we, how we want to. You want to go look at some of the irrigation in the tunnels? Sure. So here's one of our Caterpillar tunnels. We've got Two different, well, we have four different types of tunnels out here right now, but one of the main ones we're growing in is your farmer's friend, um, gothic style 
Caterpillar Town Hall with the with the lift kit and everything, all the bells and whistles there. Um, it is one of our hundred foot tunnels, and it's been turned over to winter crops. Uh, a lot of this will be for our winter CSA. Um, we've got sugar loaf chicory, um, some Swiss chard, and some direct sown beets that are starting to slowly come up. That was all cultivated yesterday, um, and in here. We're playing around with a couple different ways of irrigating. The main way we've been irrigating most of in our tunnels as well is also on wobblers, but we use the mini wobbler in here because they're they don't throw water quite as far, and we don't need we're only going four beds width versus eight in our tunnels. Um, so the way that we've been doing it this summer is putting four of those in the tunnel. Um, they're all 25 feet apart, and um, it's been fairly sufficient, although noticing as well, kind of the ends of our beds are staying a little drier than would like. So thinking of adding a fifth fifth sprinkler to this line to see if that. So what's the benefit of having the combination or using the drip sometimes, the overhead sometimes? Yeah, because in winter, we don't you don't necessarily want to be over irrigating. Um, and we can manage water a little bit more in here. You don't want, you don't want things to get be too wet and stay too wet because that can lead to things rotting and molding and all that kind of stuff that you don't necessarily want on your produce, especially as they start filling out. Um, so trying a little bit of combination of drip, which will just be doing what drip does, um, watering directly at the root source, keeping the leaves dry, um, but then also using sprinklers to help germinate the beets and doing that. And I know that's been something that people have been starting to play around with and using sprinklers for establishment, especially down here in the south where it's much hotter um, when you're trying to establish a lot of more cold loving plants like chard and beets and stuff um, using those sprinklers during the first part of their life cycle um, as they're getting established and starting to grow and then as we enter into the winter time where they don't need quite as much water and it's hopefully potentially more beneficial for them not to be getting their leaves wet quite as much um, because you don't get as much evaporation and all that kind of stuff um, trying to play around with trip as well. So this is actually the first tunnel that we're really doing that with out here at Ten Mothers. And so is that a year round strategy or is that gonna be mainly for winter? Potentially mainly for winter. Cause a lot of the things that we have on sprinklers um, in the summertime, it's, do, it's a dual purpose. They're both on sprinklers for irrigation, but they're also on sprinklers. So for cooling, um, I mean, two weeks ago, what's today today's late october and two to three weeks ago it was 98 degrees outside um and during the summer we grow we grow lettuce year or year round um throughout the full summer and so for lettuce and other things that are more cool loving crops um those sprinklers are also really benefiting um by cooling cooling the temperatures down especially in tunnels like this and it looks like all this uh all these wobblers and stands are all pretty portable there's with spikes in the ground oh, yeah. right they're just spikes in the ground um it's just a little garden spike i believe also made by orbit um and just pv half inch pvc piping that goes with them um and we've been using garden hoses you can get 25 foot lengths of garden hose but also just using the uh, three quarter inch irrigation header, irrigation header pipe it's much cheaper the fittings are much cheaper you can cut it to whatever length you want. Um, I use that on my farm. And I tend to like like using that because um, we can cut it shorter or add to it if we want to and play around with that. So we're kind of transitioning to that as we've added um, a lot more sprinklers over the season. Cool, I think this adds a lot of flexibility, yeah. especially with uh, Definitely. changes in temperature. And did, yeah. and you're also you know mixing crops, you're doing some direct seeded and some transplanted stuff yep. in here, so. Exactly. Yeah, and I mean, as you'll, or as you have seen throughout the, the tour of the farm, it's very diverse. Every every spot, except for a couple of tunnels that are solid lettuce right now, um, there's all sorts of things growing together, which is also something that has been a little challenging at times in irrigation. Um, there's a section where we have scallions, one block in the field where we have scallions as well as daikon radishes um, that are all growing together, but then the scallions were planted, there's two beds, we're planting a third of a bed a week um, and just constantly rotating those beds over. And so we're constantly having a needing to establish plants within those beds, but then the daikons are a storage crop. We've planted two beds, they got established, they're growing, they're starting to mature. And noticing that having those all on ir overhead irrigation has been a little challenging because the irrigation needs have been a little 
different. Um, so finding that like potentially like hand watering in the scallions and just hand watering those a little bit more so we're not over irrigating the daikons which then leads them to rot and things like that potentially. Um, so we're playing around, seeing what we can do and see what see what works. So I also want to just show you all a little bit we, uh, the drip that we use because um, we do a little bit of drip um, on the farm. Uh, mainly on the solanum, so our eggplant here, we also have peppers, um, okra was right here until yesterday um, that we just took out. So we do use drip a little bit uh, for some of those crops that don't necessarily like getting their leaves wet um, or the fruit quality can go down or overhead would promote disease and fungal growth and things like that. Um, so yeah, those are the main things we use it for. And then also in the tunnels on our tomatoes and stuff like that. All right, so it looks like you got a, a line that comes off the header. Yep, so we've got a header. Um, this is a, a different block here. So header, the main line's actually over on the other end there and just splits at the manifold, comes up, just have a hose. Again, that comes to this uh, filter. So it's just got a typical little screen filter on it um, that needs to get cleaned out um, and then goes down our pressure regulator so it goes down to 10 psi and then goes into our header line um, which is just again that three quarter inch um, poly tubing and at each bed we've typically done two lines of drip um, per bed no matter what's planted in it um, occasionally we'll add a third if we're using drip on a direct seeded crop because it's in between peppers or something like that that we just don't have the ability to put it on overhead irrigation um, we just got our, our manifolds at each, each bed where we, so we can manage each bed getting water or not getting water if we want to. Um, and then that just goes into the drip. So that's just one little other thing that we got. Cool. Hey Luke, thanks so much for showing up everything yeah, about your irrigation. Welcome. I know people are always looking for new ideas and, uh, Definitely. how people are doing it in different contexts and stuff like that. Yeah. Well, thank you all. And thanks for the support. And if y'all have any questions, send them our way and look forward to seeing what else comes out. All right, man. Thank you. Yeah, of course.